Welcome second graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. And we'd like to give a special welcome to the students from South Elementary in Alvarado LSD and to the students at Seagaville Elementary um, right here in Dallas ISD, uh, very close to where we're located here in Seagaville. Uh, we know you can't be here in person today, but we're going to do our best to make you feel like you're here during this virtual field trip. Uh, if you are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do that. Uh, by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. There you will be able to get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. And today's field trip is going to be all about forms of energy. So during this virtual field trip, students will investigate the effects on objects by increasing or decreasing amounts of light, heat, and sound energy. So we're gonna start off today by doing an introduction to forms of energy. Then we will explore light energy. Next, we will explore thermal energy. And last, we will explore sound energy. While we're doing all of that, you can ask us questions. Uh, the way you do that is by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And there you will fill out a very short form. Um, and you can ask us any question you like related to forms of energy. You can ask us as many questions as you like, and we will do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this morning. So let's get started with that introduction to forms of energy, and Miss Nash is going to lead us through that. I mean, Miss Mrs. Fuller. I'm sorry, Mrs. Fuller. Mrs. Fuller. Oh, gonna... that's good. All right, I'm Mrs. Fuller, and this is Lauren the chicken. Lauren the chicken laid an egg. She's an aracana, so she lays these green eggs. She got the energy to make the egg and to lay the egg from the food that she eats. Uh, she likes these worms. I'm gonna put the worms right here. We're gonna see if she'll eat the worms for us. Yeah, she will. <laughs> Let me put this out just a little bit so she can reach the worm. Well, maybe I just put her on the floor and let her have the worms. <laughs> Today in this section, we're gonna talk about energy and in this little segment we're going to talk about different kinds of energy different forms of energy energy is the ability to do work so lauren's work as a chicken as a hen she's a lady chicken her job is to make eggs so she makes the eggs and she lays the eggs but she also does a lot of other things she likes to run she likes to scratch in the dirt for all of those things, she needs energy. She gets energy from her food. That's why your parents want you to eat breakfast every day because you ex exert a tremendous amount of energy. You use a lot of energy when you run and play and also when you learn. Our brains use a tremendous amount of energy. All right, most of the energy on the earth comes from the sun. We're going to talk today about light energy, about heat energy, sound energy, even wind energy, all different kinds. Let me turn this. My timer went off prematurely. One thing you need to keep in mind as we go through these different toys and I describe to you the different kinds of energy that they're using and showing is that energy is not created and it's not destroyed. I'm not going to make any energy and I'm not going to destroy any energy. The energy we use when we play with these toys is only changing form. That's real important to remember. Now, what are the different sources of energy? Well, like we said initially, uh, energy comes from primarily for our planet comes from the sun. We get heat energy and light energy from the sun. That's how plants are able to make food. That's the work the plants do. They make food. They make food with light energy from the sun, water, and carbon dioxide. They make sugar. That's the food that we eat. Fire gives us energy, food, we've already talked about that. Gas and coal, gasoline and diesel fuel, electricity, wind and gravity. So let's look at gravity real quick. I've got a little ramp here. I'm gonna put the ramp on the desk 
and I'm going to get a little car. Oh, here's Lowly Worm. Here's Lowly Worm in his apple car. When he's resting at the top and not moving, uh, he has potential energy. There's a potential that he might burn energy. I'm going to let go of him. Gravity is going to pull him to the end of the ramp. Did you see that? So gravity pulled Lowly Worm to the end of the ramp. All right. I'll put that down. Another one we're going to talk about is wind energy. Here on our farm, if you've been out here before, you've seen our windmill. Our windmill pumps water. When the wind flies by, it turns the blades on the big fan, which in turn turn a rotor, which turn a generator, which pumps water out of the ground. A lot of windmills also make electricity instead of pumping water. But you can make a little wind with a fan. Have you ever been in the back seat of the car and it got too hot, the air conditioning wasn't reaching you? You could make your own wind, make a little cardboard fan and fan yourself. If you've ever flown a kite, you've seen the energy from the wind keep the uh, kite in the air. Here's a little wind maker. This is a children's wind maker. It's got Spider-Man on it. Can you hear the noise? It's making a nice little breeze. It's being powered by energy from a battery. The little battery makes it, uh, electricity or stores electricity. And then the, the little fan can access the energy, the electrical energy from the energy in the battery. All right, let's talk about light for a second. Here is a great big flashlight. This great big flashlight has a great big square battery. It takes up all this inside part. So this flashlight runs on the electricity stored in this kind of battery. But I have a flashlight that does not have a battery. It's not plugged into the wall and it doesn't have a battery. It gets its energy from the energy of your arm and your wrist and your hand because we're gonna make the electricity by shaking it. There's a little um, mechanical device in here that will make it, and we're gonna shake it real hard. And we're gonna turn it on. Maybe, there it is, it doesn't have a, a big, no, well, it's not on. We had some problems with it yesterday too. It may come on while I'm talking. That's what happened yesterday. I'll put it right here so if you, if you see it, you'll, you'll know that it came on. Okay, oh, here's a little device. There's a spring inside of this. This is a tape measure. When I pull the tape, did you hear that clickety-clack? When I pulled this out, it turned a wheel inside that wound up a spring. The spring has energy stored in it. When I push this button in the middle, it's going to release the spring and it's going to pull the tape measure back into the box. Watch this. Things aren't working this morning. How bizarre. Well, at any rate, in theory, that's what happens. All right, let's see what else we have. I have a little watch, a lowly worm watch, believe it or not. Here's Lowly Worm in his apple car, and I'm going to open it up, and you can see it's got a place where it tells you the time. This is run by a battery, which is electricity. Okay, I've got another spring, spring-loaded toy right here. Here's the spring. You can see that. It's kind of quivering. When I push it down, it's going to compress the spring so that when the little monster top releases, it's going to shoot him way in the air. So let's see if this one will work. Here we go. Hey, that worked out really well. It even landed in the plant. That's good. Okay, so that was spring uh, that stored the energy. Here is a, a little uh, caterpillar. He has a key on the side. When I turn the key, it winds a, a, a mechanism on the inside. 
he, he goes real slow. He doesn't go fast like Lowly Worm or like the monster on the spring. But that spring inside that I wound with the key, it had provided the energy for him. Now let's talk about sound energy for a second. This is a noisemaker. <clears throat> it's about 80 or 90 years old. It's real old. The kids used to make a lot of noises when they came up on the, the front porch at Halloween. What this, it's got a little crank on the, the back side. I'm going to hold it with my hand and move it in a big circle. You'll be able to hear the energy putting in, and you're going to be able to hear it because it's a noisemaker. It makes sound. So listen to this. Imagine having 10 kids on the front porch doing that with a noisemaker. It must have been quite amazing. Okay, I think our last thing is going to be this top. Okay, now the top has a screw right here. When I push the screw down, it's going to turn some cogs on the inside. There are two things you need to uh, observe. The first thing you need to observe, let me put this egg down, is uh, the color changing on the top. So keep your eye on that. The other thing, it's going to make a whirring sound. It's almost going to sound like a train. Okay, listen to this. Isn't that wonderful? So with the energy of my arm, we translated that into turning that big long screw, which was turning the cogs inside, which gave us a spin. It gave us a color change, and it also gave us a wonderful sound. So just remember, the sun is the most important source of energy for our planet, and that energy is not created, nor is it uh, destroyed. It simply changes form. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. Uh, the question that came up was, am I using energy all of the time? And yes, you are. Uh, even in your sleep, um, you're using energy to stay alive, uh, and your body is um, losing energy through that process, mostly by losing heat energy as you sleep. So even though it's good to get a good night's sleep so that you can wake up rested for school the next day, or if it's Saturday, you can wake up rested to uh, play, um, you still want to um, eat breakfast in the morning to put that energy that you've lost overnight back into your body so you can go to school ready to learn or if it's a Saturday you can go outside and play. All right now we're going to explore light energy with Mr. Monroe. Can you guys see me? Oh good morning my name is Mr. Monroe can you uh, see me good or see me well? Oh, just a few minutes, uh, just a couple of seconds. Is that better? Sure, that's better. We have light now, and, you know, light energy, we need that so that we can see. Now, you heard Ms. Fuller say that the sun is the ultimate source or the primary source of our energy here on the planet Earth. It is also the ultimate source of light energy because we know during daylight hours, the sun is shining. Uh, it's bright all around us unless the sunlight, the sun rays are obstructed. You know, light energy is very important simply because it allows us to see. And if we really think about light energy and the properties of light energy, one, light travels very fast. It's so quick. In fact, it's so quick. I believe it is the quickest source of energy or quickest uh, energy that we have on our planet. It is said that light travels at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. At that speed, I want you guys to really think about this. At that speed, if light could bend and curve, because it seems like light rays always go in a straight line, but if it could bend and curve around our globe, the planet Earth, do you know that it could travel around our planet eight times in one second? That's how fast it is. And you know, light 
energy is very important. The early days of man, there were no electrical lights. Primarily, the light source was the sun. But once the sun went down and everything was dark, I think they probably had to depend upon fire. Even early settlers and pioneers that crossed this great land, they had to defend, depend on fire also. Uh, they probably used something like this. Probably not like this exactly, but they probably used a candle. And we know the fire from a candle can give us a certain amount of light energy. Not very much, as we see in this classroom today, but it gives a little bit of light. Now, the light sources that you're familiar with today, basically in your house or your apartment, is usually a, a light source that has changed electrical energy into light energy. For example, this lamp. Now, this lamp is an electrical lamp. It has a light bulb. It has a switch. If I turn it on, we've got light. Now, the light is obstructed because we have a lampshade on it. Most of the light is coming out of the top and out of the bottom, okay? We're going to talk about obstruction of light in just a little bit, but some of the other light sources that we use in our everyday lives, there's a variety of them. For example, in my closet at home, I have some extra light because the electrical light that's in my closet is kind of dim, so I have some extra light that we call portable light sources and this little light looks like an electrical light source but it's not it's portable because it's run off of electrical energy from batteries that are in this base simply turn it on and now we have light okay turn it off and the light goes off also we have real bright lights that some people use called spotlights and this is very bright. It would shine very bright if it was dark in here. And it would be shining on one spot, not lighting up the whole lab like the ceiling lights have done. Mechanics might use a light that looks like this, a trouble light. If they're working under a hood or on a motor, this would attach itself to the metal part, and they could see what they're doing on that engine trying to repair that car motor. Also, at night, we have what we call lanterns. On a camping trip, you might see a mini lantern like this, and it would provide light for the camp area. Now, my favorite light, because I like to hunt and fish, is a, a headlight, and a headlight looks something like this. Of course, if I had a cap on, it would be better. Put it on your head. And it would keep you from walking over stuff if you're walking around in the woods or walking down close to the pond trying to fish. You simply turn that headlight on, and it's pretty bright. And, you know, that, that would be a good way to even work on things around your house that there wasn't enough light, like under the sink or under the cabinets. You could use something like this. You know, there's another amazing light, too, that I want to show you. It's called a snorkel light. Now, this one most likely could be used by a mechanic that has lost a tool down in a deep area where he can't get one of these other portable light sources to. And simply, he would run this little snorkel down in there and then turn the, the light switch on. And you can see it does have a bright light on it. You know, there are some instances, instances where... You don't need a lot of bright light, even safety safe. So a lot of lights are equipped with what we call dimmers. For example, cars or automobiles that are traveling down the highway and there's a car coming from one direction and another car coming from the other direction, meeting them at night, you know, there's a dimmer switch that allows those headlights on the cars to be dim because Oh, when they're on bright, they can blind one another. In fact, you could get a ticket if you didn't have courtesy to dim your lights when meeting another automobile on the highway. And I have one such light here that's a special light that basically, let me turn it on, 
It is an LED light and it's really bright, isn't it? It also has what we call a dimmer switch. It dimmed it down and I can even cut it back to where only one part of this light is going to light up and that's the end. So there are a variety of lights that we use in our everyday lives, students. In fact, there's one that can really help you out that's attached to a very special tool. You know, if you got a splinter or a thorn in your finger, you probably run and tell your mom or your dad, and they would take you maybe into the bathroom and they'd reach up in the cabinet, the medicine cabinet, and they would find a little tool called a tweezer or forceps. And they would start searching for that splinter or thorn that's in your finger. And uh, they would start trying to get that out. Well, a lot of times those thorns and those splinters are so small, they're very hard to see. Well, this is a very special tool right here. It has the tweezers. But along with the tweezers, it's got a light. So that would help them find that little thorn or that splinter to get it out. On top of that, there is a hand magnifier, a magnifying glass that would make everything look bigger than what it looks like in real life. So that would really help them find that thorn or that little uh, splinter that's in your finger. So that's, a, that's, that's really a, a useful tool, isn't it? And again, lights can make a whole big difference when they're dim. In fact, this headlight could be used in our astronomy program out here because we don't like to use bright lights out there. And you can turn this astronomy light or this headlight down to the red to where your eyes would simply adjust to the darkness and you'd be able to study the stars a little better. And of course, we know that on cloudy days when the ultimate light source or light energy source is kind of blocked a little bit, it feels a little better. It's a little cooler. And hopefully what I've gone over with you today as far as light energy has been very helpful. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Broughton right quick. So if any of you have any questions, maybe he can answer those for you. I want you guys to have a good day the rest of the day, okay? All right, Mr. Broughton. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And we got a question from uh, Karen at Seagalville Elementary. And her question is, how do batteries work? Um, there are chemicals inside a battery that uh, allow electrons to um, flow from the positive uh, side of the battery or the terminal of the battery to the negative. And then when you connect wires to that battery, the um, electricity will flow through the wires and go to whatever you're trying to um, turn on. So like an example would be a light bulb or maybe a speaker um, or a toaster or whatever you're trying to make work. Uh, that's the basics on how the batteries work. Um, I'll maybe look up some more information here while, while um, Mr. Ramirez is going over thermal energy and see if I can't find out a little bit more about that. But let's move on to um, thermal energy with Mr. Ramirez. Hello, my name is Mr. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about thermal energy. Thermal energy is simply heat energy, and heat energy is just energy that makes things warmer. Typically, thermal energy will move from things that are warmer to things that are cooler. Now, specifically in this segment, we're going to be focusing on what effect does increasing or decreasing thermal energy have on materials. So as I show you a variety of uh, materials, we're thinking about how they're impacted by heat. Uh, so the first thing we're going to take a look at, y'all are probably familiar with it already, it's a thermometer. And the way a thermometer works, I'm going to use this special science tool called a hand boiler. The way a thermometer works is when the liquid inside gets heated, the liquid will expand or rise. So I'm using my body heat to warm up this liquid, and you can see the liquid is rising to the top. So this is the same principle that helps our thermometers work. When the thermometer gets heated, the red liquid inside will rise or expand to the top. When it gets cooler outside, that liquid will shrink or contract and it will move back down. Now another example of how materials are affected by heat is something that you guys are probably familiar with, and that is some popsicles. So if we take a look at these popsicles, how do you think they were affected by increasing or decreasing thermal energy? So let's take a look at the frozen popsicle. 
when I put my frozen popsicle into uh, the freezer, I was removing heat energy. When I remove heat energy, it became a lot colder. The particles that make up our frozen particle, our frozen popsicle, uh, became much more slower moving. And because it became more slower moving, it allowed my popsicle to solidify or turn into a hard solid. Now, if I leave my frozen popsicle out at room temperature, just leave it on my desk, the room temperature will add heat energy to my popsicle. And eventually over time, that heat energy will cause the particles that make up the popsicle to start moving around super rapidly. And when those particles move around very fastly, it's going to cause this solid uh, popsicle to turn into a liquid. And that is how we get phase changes. It's because of a change in thermal energy. Now, another example we're going to take a look at, y'all have probably seen one of these. This is a lava lamp. A lava lamp also works on principles of increasing and decreasing thermal energy. So there is actually a bulb inside. When I use electrical energy uh, by plugging it into an outlet, this lava lamp is converting electrical energy into thermal energy. That light bulb is heating up the water and the glitter inside. And when things get hot, they expand and they will rise. So this hot water at the bottom and the hot glitter are going to start to rise to the top of the lava lamp. Once they get to the top of the lava lamp, it's further away from the hot bulb, so it's going to start to cool down. And when things cool down, they start to sink. So then it will sink to the bottom, and the whole cycle will start all over again. And that is how come we see the constant movement inside a lava lamp. Now, the big word for that movement is called convection. So it's just the principle that when things get hot, they rise. When they cool, they sink. And that's actually responsible for our hurricanes. So that's a lava lamp. The next thing we're going to talk about is how uh, some kitchen appliances can be used to increase or decrease heat energy and how that impacts our food that we eat. So y'all are probably familiar with this kitchen appliance. It's a toaster. So be thinking about how we use this toaster to change foods that we eat, such as bread. So what happens to that piece of bread after you put it in the toaster? How does it change? The next thing we're going to look at is a portable stove top. So this one's electric, but I have um, a little pot and I have a container of ramen noodle. So how do you think heat impacts pasta and rices? So that's another question to think about how heat changes and impacts our food. So the next thing I want to show you guys, um, I'm going to share my screen with you guys and show you a couple of pictures of other food items and also how heat impacts some things here at the Environmental Center. So I'm going to go ahead and present my screen. And then we'll go over some of those uh, pictures and videos. And again, we're learning about the effects of increasing or decreasing heat energy. In these photos, we're going to be looking at the effects of increasing heat energy. So we use, obviously, a lot of heat energy when we're cooking food. So here we have a grill. We have heat energy over here. Um, so what effect do you think heat has on things like chicken and potatoes? So we use heat energy to help cook our food. Um, it helps to crisp up our chicken and crisp up our potatoes. The potatoes, when they were raw, they were hard, and when we cooked them, they became softer. Um, for those that like desserts, sweet desserts, this is creme brulee. So the creme brulee, the uh, hard sugary coating that you see in the top, the sugar was originally that white sugar. They burned it, and now it's that nice caramelized, crunchy piece of sugar that you see on top. So heat is actually very important for a lot of our foods that we enjoy eating. And then here's some French onion soup. So what do you think happened to this cheese over here when I put it into the hot bowl of soup? What do you think happened to it? So when you mix that cheese with the hot bowl of soup, the cheese starts to melt. So a lot of our foods like butter uh, will also melt when they come in contact with heat. And then for career-wise, here's an example of a welding machine. And we can actually use heat to transform different materials like metals. So I'm just going to show you this quick little video. Um, this is a little video of welding. So we're trying to uh, weld or melt two pieces of metal together. And it looks that weird color because the video is being taken through a welding helmet. So you never want to look at the flames with your eyes. 
So we always want to practice good safety measures when we're around uh, hot themes. And then you can see uh, where these two pieces of metal were welded together right here in that seam. And that was to create a little fence. And then again, safety measures. So make sure we wear uh, safety gloves and safety helmets when we're around hot things. An example of how we use welding here at the Environmental Center, all of our panels, our livestock panels that keep our animals from running away are all welded together uh, with steel. And then, oops, I think that was a little video. So this uh, panel here is keeping our goat Jabez inside so that he's safe from predators. And that's Jabez the goat peeping through his welded fence panel. And then the next video is also one of our other farm animals who is utilizing um, her welded fence panel. So again, we can use heat energy uh, to melt metals and kind of join them together. And that's just one of our calves. And then also heat energy affects our water sources out here. So this was once a pond that we had behind our facility. So what do you think, or how do you think heat energy affected our ponds and lakes that we have here? So it's been so hot and dry lately that the heat energy caused evaporation. The water particles, uh, the particles that make up the water in this pond, they were moving so rapidly that it caused a phase change and it went from a liquid into a gas. So our water evaporated and that's what's left. And then this is just a quick little um, video. This is live wire. Um, live wire is actually an alloy metal. It's nickel and titanium. So we're gonna see the effect of heat when I place it in the water. So this is a cool um, material. It's called nitinol, and it has the ability to remember its original shape. So no matter what shape I put it in, when I put it in the hot water, it will always revert back to the original shape. This is a bimetal bar. It is actually made out of two metals, nickel and stainless steel. Now this is gonna show us how metals expand due to heat. Now because nickel and stainless steel have different expansion rates, when I put it in the hot water, it's gonna start to bend. Now this is an important concept. Uh, the expansions of metal and the bendings of metal due to heat, this is important because it's this same process uh, that's actually in our thermostats. So if you look in your classroom or at home, you have those thermostats that control our temperatures. Uh, those thermostats actually have a similar bimetal strip. And when that bimetal strip reaches a certain temperature, it will actually close the circuit and it will turn your AC or your heater on. So again, you can see it's bending with my flame. We're gonna be doing an experiment to demonstrate thermal energy and how it changes materials. So we're gonna be using a hoop and we're also gonna be using a sphere or a ball. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm actually gonna insert my sphere into my hoop apparatus. I'm just gonna fast forward just a little bit, um, but uh, so right. what you're gonna see and, here. Uh, a Pyrex filled with hot water, but the water just wasn't boiling enough. Oops. Um, I'm just gonna explain really quick since we're running out of time. In that picture, uh, what I had were two, um, two spheres, and let me show you really quick what they were. So it was these two items. When I put this one in the heat, this sphere actually expanded. So when things get hot, they expand. And it expanded so much that it would no longer fit through the hoop. Uh, so that's just another example to demonstrate the expansion of things when they get heated. So before you guys go, I just have a quick couple of questions for you guys. My reflection question is uh, give three examples of how you or a parent or an adult used thermal energy today. So think about what y'all did today and how you used thermal energy. My next is just a quick challenge question. How will increasing or decreasing thermal energy um, affect a chocolate candy like these Hershey's Kisses? So what's gonna happen if I freeze these in the freezer or what's gonna happen if I leave them outside on a hot sunny day? Um, and that's all I have for you guys for thermal energy. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pass it back to Mr. Broughton, and he's going to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mears. Um, we got two more questions. Um, the first is from Brantley. How does light energy work? Uh, light is a form of energy. It travels in a straight line as a wave until it hits something, and then it will be absorbed by whatever it hits, or it can reflect 
off of whatever it hits and that's how we see things because light bounces off what we see and then travels to our eyes and we see it and then the next question is from carly how does heat make things rise if you heat up some air um, that air will expand or like get bigger and when it gets bigger it becomes less dense than the other air and then it will float on that air and move up so that's how hot air balloons work for example all right now we're going to move on to sound energy with miss nash hello welcome to my classroom today we're going to be talking and thinking about sound so i was sitting here and i was listening to the ocean in my seashell do you think it's really the ocean? I don't think so. No water coming out. I wonder what I'm hearing. Because I'm hearing something. Let's think about that. And maybe we we'll can figure it out. Sound is a kind of energy you can hear. It's made from vibration. So to vibrate means to move back and forth. So I'm vibrating the paper. And you can see it moving. What you can't see is the fact that as it moves, it's moving the particles of air. And the vibrations go all around the room and they go in my ear. And the vibrations can be different. So some are loud. It's called volume. So volume means it's loud or soft. Are we yelling or whispering? Volume. <clears throat> Sound can also be have different pitch, a different pitch. It can be high or low. So different sounds have different volume and pitch. Now, if you hum, you can feel that vibration in your throat. They can move through air, through water, or solids. And water, in fact, is a very good conductor of sound. And you can test next time you're in a pool, maybe next summer. And if you shout under water, your friends can hear you. And whales can sing their song, and 100 miles away, another whale can hear them. 100 miles away, they're communicating with that sound over hundreds of miles. So we can also use the fact that water, even water in the air, like fog, a bit of water in the air, we can use that for safety. So if you're in a ship next to the, a rocky coast, and you're in danger of running the ground, you might look for the, the lighthouse, but you might also listen for the fog horn. Mm -hmm. A big horn will make a noise and it will warn the sailors not to get too close. But that sound is going to travel really well through that damp air. So we can hear because we have and inside your ear, we have an eardrum. Got my little drum here. And I have the skin stretched over the top, and I can hit it and it vibrates the drum and then the air inside. Inside your ear, you have a little drum or skin, okay, tiny, tiny. And when the vibration of the air hits it, you can hear. But that tiny drum. And delicate, and we need to protect it. So loud noises, we use loud noises for to warn of danger sometimes. Like here, when we have a fire drill, that fire alarm goes off, and it's so loud to let everyone know it's time to leave the building. But it can also hurt your ears. So I put my fingers in my ear while I walk out. I can still hear the alarm going on. So if someone's doing work with a loud machine, okay, they need to put ear protection. And those teenagers with their headphones and their loud music, they're going to damage their hearing. Because that tiny, tiny eardrum can be damaged by loud noises. So it's important to remember that and protect your ears. Now, sound, when we think about volume, we can have loud or not so loud. We also have pitch. And you can make yourself a little instrument like this just as a box and some rubber bands and you can experiment with varying the pitch by how tightly you, you pull that, that rubber band so it's a fun thing to experiment with 
Yeah, I got my owl friends here today. Because when we think about sound, we think about what we do, sing music, but animals use sound also. And our owl friends, if you hear them, they'll go. Now, this one kind of hisses. But if you're outside, you might hear, hoo 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 Those are the owls calling. But they're not saying hello, hello. They're saying, hey, I'm here. You go away. They're marking their territory. So animals are using their sound for communication. And what I want you to think about today is maybe go around your house or the neighborhood and see if you can find something that makes a loud sound and something that makes a soft sound. And then think about why were they making it? So in my house, my dog was barking loud. A loud bark. Why was the dog barking? The dog is barking because someone is knocking at the door. And the dog is telling me there's someone here, someone here. The cat is purring softly because he's happy. And when I hear that sound, it makes me happy too. So animals make all kinds of different sounds for different reasons. And you can think about why they're making those sounds. And if you go to the park, take a walk at the park and find a nice quiet spot and sit down and listen and see what you can hear. So yesterday I went outside and I was trying to catch, get some <laughs> tape. I was trying to tape some birds. So of course, every time I got close enough to one, they flew away. But you can listen to the birds singing okay, and insects calling and the leaves rustling and then come home and draw a picture. Another fun thing to do is to make your own musical instrument. You can make unusual instruments using bottles. You can vary the amount of water in your bottle. Okay, make it work. To make a different, a higher sound. You can experiment with different kinds of, of shakers. Okay, so I made this one of two cups with some chopsticks inside. It makes two sounds. And I use things like this to train the dog. When the dog is doing something I don't want him to do, I make a loud noise. And then he goes, oh, oh, I guess I'm not, I shouldn't do that. I mean, no. It's the way you train your dog. So, oh, oh and a fun, another fun thing to do in our socially distant world is to make a tin can phone. And you can prove to yourself that sound goes through solid like our rope. And you have two tin cans, clean them out, and make sure there's no sharp bit. And then you and your friend or someone in your family, and you can whisper in one hand, you know, pull that, pull this string tight, and then you can talk, this can whisper. And then your friend can hear it. Okay. And you can experiment with different kinds of, of rope, different kinds of cans. I tried it with a paper cut, because that was really easy to make a hole. It didn't work very well. So this one you'll need an adult's help. I just used a big nail and a hammer to make the hole. And then I put my string in and I can make a, a tin can telephone. So lots of fun things to do with sound and to think about why animals are making those sounds or why other things are making sounds. So thank you and Mr. Broughton will answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Nash. I'm going to share my screen here because I did find, I think, something that illustrates how batteries work. Um, just because I know um, explaining without a picture is not quite as good. So there is a picture of a battery. And you can see that there's chemicals in the battery. And then there's a negative terminal and a positive terminal. You would see that on the outside of the battery. Sometimes on a AA or C or D battery, the positive side is on one end and the negative side is on the other, but on this battery, they're both at the top. Um, kind of like a car battery works or a nine volt battery. And uh, there's an, a negative electrode here that attracts all of these electrons that are negatively charged. And then there's a positive electrode that doesn't have any electrons. So these negative electrons then flow out of that terminal through a wire and they will light up a, a light bulb or, or power anything that you put there 
and flow through that and back into this um, positive electrode and they they keep going around and around uh, creating a complete circuit so that's how a little bit better how batteries work all right let's do a quick recap of what we did today today we uh, explored all sorts of forms of energy during this virtual field trip we investigated the effects on objects by increasing or decreasing amounts of light heat and sound energy so first we saw that introduction to forms of energy with Mrs. Fuller. Next we explored light energy with Mr. Monroe. Then we explored thermal energy with Mr. Ramirez. And we just finished exploring sound energy with Ms. Nash. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we're glad to have you here virtually. Uh, we wish it could be in person, but virtual for now. And we'd like to know what you think about this field trip. And so you can let us know what you think by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and filling out a short form. It takes about one, maybe two minutes to fill out. And you can tell us what you think about um, how we did today. Have a great morning and rest of your day. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>